the VP of Global Issues for Clearinghouse on Women's Issues. This is my first event I've organized since joining the board a few months ago, so thank you to the speakers that so kindly responded <laughs> and are here today. Um, so we have Selena and Jeanette from the League of Women Voters. Could you speak up a little? It's very hard okay. to hear that. Um, we have Allegra from Common Cause and Erin from the Campaign Legal Center. So here it is, two weeks, 14 days to the election. Mm excited or re-energized sounds like everybody's doing their part to get out the vote so we really just wanted to have an event in October to really um, think about what are the ways um, the law can influence our rights and the ability to have safe and fair elections um, so for me I was interested in doing this event because <coughs> politics is in my blood I love election day election day is better than Christmas and I love Christmas <laughs> um, I think I've been in politics since I was six or seven years old was the first time I went canvassing with my family. Um, my dad was the county chair up in New Jersey, so every election day I spent making calls, knocking on doors, and then hunkered down in the war room at night, scribbling the figures as they came in and the precincts reported. So I've, I've been in this game for a long time, even though I'm sort of in international human rights. Um, but a few years ago, back in 2009, my sister Kristen decided to run for a county office. Um, I was still in law school at the time, living down here, and basically kept Amtrak in business for a year, uh, running her campaign and then her re-election campaign a few years ago. And then last year, she stood for state senate and uh, thankfully won. <laughs> but um, so in these experiences, I thought I've seen everything. Um, you know, I've struggled with the get out the vote effort, you know, pulling my hair out to get people to overcome their political apathy and understand who's voting and, and what are the issues they care about. Um, but I've also seen the other side, you know, massive suppression efforts. Um, however, this year, what we're seeing in Georgia, the purging of the polls, or the rolls rather, and what we're seeing in North Dakota with the new voter ID requirements, which is surgically targeting the Native American community, these are really particularly harrowing. Um, so it's really important that we have these wonderful folks to be here. It's obviously, laws made at the state and federal and local level can have a huge effect, but there are some less obvious ways um, that the law can interact with our voting process. And what we don't necessarily think about, but campaign finance is a huge component of that. And the Citizen United decision a few years ago basically said corporations and unions have free speech, it's a protected speech under the First Amendment, and they have the right to give as much money as they want. And that's really um, something that's infiltrated our elections um, from the top of the ballot in federal to our local county elections and county elections. So that said, I'm really excited to have all these folks here to expound on these issues. And I will turn it over to Jen. Great. Well, thank you, Megan. And thank you, everyone, for being here with us today and inviting uh, me to be here 
I just quickly wanted to go through some statistics related to the 2016 election cycle as we're thinking about the 2018 cycle and what the excitement level looks like, et cetera. Um, in 2016, there were 116 million women who were eligible to vote. There were 28 million African Americans who were eligible to vote. There were uh, four, the Latin Latinx population increased by four million. Uh, eligible voters in the 2016 cycle, and the APIA vote also increased significantly during that time frame. So then according to census, there were 108 million people who were eligible to vote in 2016 but opted out for a variety of reasons, or maybe they were kept out. So, you know, they, they mm -hmm. might have not turned out to vote of their own accord, but many of these laws that Megan uh, mentioned also are keeping people from the ballot as well. So the voting challenges that people are seeing some of them are really systemic and some of them are related to the individual. Um, we see the discriminatory voting laws themselves, whether that's photo identification or documentary proof of citizenship or rules related to matching when somebody's voter registration form actually comes in. And all of these different rules impact the different uh, communities differently, right? So in Georgia, and we'll talk about Georgia purging, but in Georgia there's a separate issue where there is a matching issue, and so someone's name on their voter registration form needed to match with their name in the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles, but there weren't enough places for people's names to be included. So anybody mm. from the Latinx community who had a multiple last name, last name, did not could not match properly because the DMV simply didn't have the appropriate number of spaces and therefore their names weren't matching and then they were ending up in this like pending category or being uh, dismissed altogether. And so it's, it's small things that you might not know about that really keep people out of the system and these really are systemic issues. But then separately there are individual issues related to the information that people have. Sometimes it's intentionally misleading. Uh, people are spreading information related to what ID might be required in different states when that's not actually required in your state at all. So knowing what that information is is important. But it's also the lack of information as far as who the candidates are or what the process is going to be at the polling place, what machines I'm going to be using. People don't want to look like they don't know what they're doing. And so when they don't know what they're facing when they walk in the door, sometimes they choose not to because they don't want to look in their own mind stupid. Even though everyone is a first time voter at some point, everybody didn't know what that process was at some point. Um, and then really having the absence of a plan for election day, whether you're taking advantage of early voting that they have in places like DC and Maryland, uh, or voting on election day, research actually says that if you have a plan on election day, if you've answered the question of where, when, and how I'm going to vote, you are actually more likely to turn out and vote. If you thought through what time of day you're going to be there, how am I going to get there? Do I drive my car? Do I take public transportation? Can I walk? Right? If you have actually thought through what your process is going to be, you are much more likely to turn out to vote. And those have nothing to do with the laws. That's just what people need so that they can uh, turn out and participate effectively. But you'll also see last minute changes at the polling plate, or last minute changes that can affect people as well. Allegro is going to talk a little bit more about the purging issue, so I won't really go into that. But we also see changes related to times and locations for polling places. I mean, just think of the aftermath of the hurricanes that we're having in the states right now. Polling places were wiped out. So what is the information channel right now to help voters know where they're supposed to go? Or how can they get an absentee ballot or leverage some other method for voting in their communities? That lack of information is, again, something that really stops people from turning out to vote. Um, in these midterm elections, we've really seen that this is a year of opportunity. We have a cadre of candidates that is more diverse than we've ever seen before. We've seen more women. We've seen more LGBTQ plus uh, candidates running for office. And if they don't win, they're staying in their communities and leaning forward to lead their communities uh, in the future in new ways. And this has really been, uh, throughout the primary season, a nearly unprecedented turnout for the primaries. And so we're anticipating that this is going to be unprecedented turnout for the uh, general election as well. And we have some other indicators that are leading us to believe that as well. But we're also seeing many more competitive races, right? This year, people have said, enough is enough. I'm running for office. 
So in areas where we've had just uncontested races in the past, we're seeing many more competitive races. This also relates back to a different uh, voting rights issue related to redistricting, um, where if the people are really getting the opportunity to choose their elected officials versus the elected officials choo choosing their voters, but we're seeing in four states right now that there are redistricting ballot initiatives uh, on the ballot where the citizens are trying to take control of the redistricting process in their states. Mm -hmm. And that too will also have an impact on the coming election cycles for competitive races because it's competitive races that does also really generate interest and really get people to turn out to vote. Um, and you think with all this technology that's out there, uh, there's so many new ways to communicate with people, it's really this interpersonal uh, interaction, the person to person, the door knocking that multiple people in this room have said that they're going to go participate in. It's phone banking. It's real people talking to other real people about the issues and encouraging them to vote and inviting them into the process that makes a huge difference in getting people to participate. And of course, there's really just this groundswell of political awareness right now between the youth, the youth voters and the gun safety and the Me Too movement that's happening right now. There is just this huge <coughs> rebirth in uh, political awareness right now that we really can't uh, speak enough to right now. It's really driving people to turn out. It's really motivating people. But when you have this level of interest, you also see an interest uh, in politicians to control who can turn out. And again, Allegra will talk a little bit more about the laws um, in this area. So really, it's whether people are looking for ways to engage. And it's whether they're turning out to vote, or running for office, or volunteering for a campaign, or a nonpartisan group like the League of Women Voters, or Common Cause, or others. Um, you know, this is how people are choosing to really try to engage this year. So what is the League seeing across the country? Uh, we really had an unprecedented number of people coming to us to say, please do voter registration drives. Uh, in fact, so many people were coming in some communities that we didn't have the woman power to actually yeah. accommodate everyone. This is a good problem to have in <laughs> one way, but it's also disappointing because there are people who really needed additional assistance that we couldn't help. Uh, and again, there's just this groundswell of women uh, who are really interested in joining organizations. I mean, we had our own national convention and our uh, audience was first of all sold out for the first time in my nearly 20 years uh, with the league. Uh, we have all these new women who are coming in to try to lead the organization who want to make a difference in their communities. And again, many of this, these women are running for office, but some of them are really just getting engaged in, in advocacy and trying to change the laws in their communities so that their communities are more representative um, and meeting the needs of, of the, the people in those areas. We're also seeing record-breaking interest in our information itself. Uh, Kathy, our DC League president, sent around uh, something already about Vote411. But we have this website called Vote411, uh, and we are seeing more traffic in 2018 than we did in 2016. We mm -hmm. have never had a non-presidential year with more interest and more people coming to look for information. Now. So far, we've already served 2 million voters. We're anticipating serving 2 million more voters between now and Election Day. And those people come, and they put in their address, and they find who's going to be on their ballot, where those candidates stand on the issues, so that they can make a, a decision about who would best represent them. They can find out what is the ID law in my state. What early voting options are available to me? What are the absentee balloting rules? So that the, there is no misinformation uh, for the folks that are coming to to vote for one one to find the information that they need uh, when they come there. And every single voter across the country will be able to find candidates uh, on their ballot. And um, through this mechanism is really one of the ways that we see um, that, again, just this ongoing level of interest. We mean, people are engaged and feel empowered uh, or want to feel the power themselves and take the power back into their own hands during this process, given the political environment, given the, where we are as a country right now. And we're really seeing this, this increased level of interest in, in everything that's ongoing. And one of the key pieces that is happening right now has been growing for years is uh, the Election Protection Coalition. So people do have actual real problems on Election Day. Most of the th those things do relate to their voter registration status. So on Election Day, somebody comes into the polling place and they're not 
uh, on the list for a variety of reasons. Um, maybe they're at the wrong, wrong polling place, et cetera. The election protection hotlines, and uh, there's one available in English, there's one in Spanish, there's one in, that can support Asian languages, and there's one in Arabic uh, as well, so that people can call in and get the assistance that they need. The English language one is 866-OUR-VOTE. Uh, if anyone can is uh, working with folks and wants to communicate that, uh, that would be very really helpful to folks. Again, that's 866-OUR-VOTE. And really, what can we be doing as we lead up to the election? Again, we can volunteer. We can volunteer, again, to door knock. People already had that, but you can do it for a candidate. You can do it for a nonpartisan organization. You can volunteer to support one of the hotlines that's helping voters and answering the questions uh, when they call in. You can make your own election day plan and encourage the people around you to also have an election day plan. In some areas, one of the biggest hangups at the polling place is the long ballot. And if people knew who they were voting for and what, how they were voting on the ballot initiatives, that helps the lines move along much, much, much faster, which then uh, reduces problems at the polling place and ensures that people, more people can turn out and to vote and have their vote counted. Because some people do abandon uh, the polling place just because the line is too long. So even small things that we do to prepare ourselves and ask our friends and family to prepare themselves make a big difference on the election day itself. Um, really, spread the word. It is the personal interactions. It's your social media. It's what you're doing with your family, friends, and colleagues. It's what you're doing on the street. Talking to people about the issues and why it's important for them to turn out. We have the power in our hands to make this election what we want it to be. And making sure that we keep the message positive right now. I mean, there's a lot of information information out there about election integrity and concerns about the security of our election process, that kind of messaging right now actually depresses turnout amongst the low propensity voters. And we really want people to turn out right now. So making sure that we ourselves are keeping our message positive during this window. Yes, we want to fix the problems. Yes, we want to be aware of them. But when we're communicating publicly, talking about why it's important, um, you know, somebody recently said to me, well, what do you say to that apathetic voter who says my vote doesn't count? And I said, well, you know, one thing is when you don't vote, you have given the person 100% more power because now they have their vote and yours because you didn't exercise your right to vote. And people are like, wow, when you talk about it in terms of power and that the people they disagree with now have just that much more power because of their own decision to not turn out to vote, uh, can make a really big difference in keeping things um, and getting people engaged. But it's always really about the personal connection and how the election will impact the issues that they care about. And so how do we tie in and communicate, whether it's about you know, health care or immigration rights or women's rights, what about these elections will impact those issues for those individuals? And really having open conversations with people so that you're hearing what issue is important to them so that you can tie your conversation back um, to what they're saying is really important to them. Um, now, post-election, what can we do after the election? Because we are going to have challenges, and there are going to be things that we're going to try, want to try to fix. From the league's perspective, we have a variety of issues that we really um, are looking at as far as re reforming the process and holding our elected officials accountable. Um, you can see we have uh, most a lot of these really relate to uh, the voter registration system because that is a key barrier for people coming into the cycle and being able to exercise the right to vote. And in fact, uh, research has actually demonstrated that election day registration is the single most important reform that we all can pass that brings more people into the process. It's not just making it more convenient for people, it's actually bringing new voters into the process. And so if you really are wanting to help uh, low propensity voters and new people have their voices heard, uh, same day registration is one of the key pieces there. Uh, and again, there are just a variety of ways for you to engage, whether it's joining in a, a local organization in your community who's focusing on these issues. There's a lot of advocates in this room right now uh, and probably watching this program as well. And there are a lot of groups out there who are trying to make a difference in communities all across the country on whatever the issue is. And I do encourage you to join your local league uh, in your community as well. They are working on the issues that the, the membership in those areas are saying, these are the key issues for our community. 
these are the laws we need to change. These are the administrative practices we need to change. These are the people who are left out of decision-making power in our community, and we need to be engaging them. And so uh, getting active in your local league is really one of the, the great ways that you can uh, also engage moving forward beyond Election Day, because there are going to be problems, and we are going to be working to address them for the next cycle as well. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Allegra, who will actually dive a little bit more into the, uh, the actual election laws. Thanks, Jeanette. Yes, yeah, so thanks for having me here. Um, I've been at Common Cause for four years now, and um, we have, Common Cause has been around for nearly 50 years, where we've got members and supporters across the country, upwards of a million supporters now, um, and we've got 35 state chapters. And our aim um, is to hold power accountable. Um, and I think a lot of people in this room, a lot of organizations who are working in this field right now would say, never has there been a more important time, um, you know, at least in the past century, than, 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 than it is now to hold power accountable. Um, so we do that, we work on voting in elections, campaign finance reform, um, you know, working against um, gerrymandering issues. And when it comes to uh, this election, you know, it really behooves all of us who work in this space to be vigilant both before, during, and after. Um, elections, you know, obviously are not a once every couple years event. You know, in order to have a smooth election, in order to ensure that people who are eligible are showing up voting and then actually having those ballots counted, we need to do the work ahead of time, we need to do the work on election day, and then once we see what the what the patterns and practices are, we need to learn um, from, that, from that election to, to determine what do we need to do next, what are the reforms that we need to put into place. Um, it's, it's pretty sad these days, right? And actually has been for a while, because even on a good day during an historic election in 2016, um, we barely budged 60% turnout, eligible turnout. Um, when you look at 32 other um, well-established democracies across the world, we come in 26th place. Um, it's pretty pitiful. And there, there are a couple of reasons, a few reasons for this. Um, one, it's the culture um, is stacked against the voter um, and has been um, in this country for some time now. So whereas in other democracies, you know, there's um, the government will take it upon itself to ensure that all eligible citizens are registered. Um, in some instances, even requiring eligible, or eligible voters to show up and vote. Um, in this country, um, we put up the obstacle course. Um, we, in, we try to make it so that the voter has to prove him or herself in order to participate in a democracy that affects us all. Um, so in the first place, we're kind of working against this culture. Um, and um, trying to do whatever we can do, again, through reform, through education, through litigation when necessary, to ensure that individuals, eligible citizens, know that they have the right to register and vote and then are getting um, the proper services that they need in order to do that. So, for example, um, registration is the biggest barrier um, to uh, a lot of people showing up to vote. There's also a big disparity between um, uh, who's between um, uh, people of color and um, uh, low income versus high income individuals when it comes to who's registered and who isn't. The end result of that, right, is that disparities from the past continue into the future. Um, so the way that we're trying to break down those barriers at Common Cause, as so many other civil rights um, good government organizations are trying to do, is to eliminate that registration barrier to ensure that um, it's almost an automatic. Um, so we, alongside a, a number of other groups, have been pushing for automatic voter registration across the country. This is a process in which, um, you know, once you show up at a, an agency, say the DMV, any number of other agencies, um, you know, you're already in the system. And um, when you do a transaction there, so long as you're eligible, you're automatically registered to vote. Mm. Um, that way, that first barrier is eliminated. The next step, too, though, right, is to ensure that once people get registered, that they know their rights and that they have a reason for showing up and to keep showing up. So Pew, in addition to a, a whole bunch of organizations, frequently asks, um, asks voters or would-be voters <coughs> why um, they didn't show up on Election Day. Again, right, where are these other 40-plus percent mm -hmm. of people during the elections? People have a lot of reasons um, for why they don't show up. Sometimes it's you know, um, I feel powerless. Jeanette, you were talking about that. You know, a lot of Americans feel powerless, especially 
um, you know, when they see special interests stacked against them, especially when they feel as though there's this huge flood of money in politics, and what's, who am I, you know, in, in relation to all these other special interests who get the benefit for, from all this money in, in the game. Um, so they feel powerless, they feel as though their vote doesn't count. Um, and, and that's something, Aaron's probably going to address the, the issues that, um, that are affected there with campaign finance reform. That's sort of like another part, piece uh, of the puzzle that needs to get fixed. But even when you, when you take that part of it out, a good 50 to 60 percent also say, the reason I'm not showing up is because, um, you know, I didn't have the time, or my polling place wasn't nearby me, or, um, you know, it wasn't accessible to me, um, either through disability or an illness. I think 12% actually said that due to disability or an illness, this wasn't uh, um, accessible to me. Um, so a lot of the reasons, and it's about 50% who don't show up, are because, you know, again, they're not a part of the system. They haven't been registered. They haven't been able to access their polling place in the way that um, you know a lot of other Americans can. So you know how do we make it more accessible? And then a third piece of this pie, and this is something that Jeanette was talking about too, is you know there are politicians who are already in the system who want to rig the rules in their favor. Um, we saw this really gain speed um, after 2010 <clears throat> when. Over half the states um, put into place a number of repressive measures in order um, to keep people from the ballot box. So whether uh, North Carolina, case in point, I'll talk quickly about North Carolina from a few years ago, and then we can, um, we can take a look at what's been going on in Georgia lately. But in North Carolina, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting story of, um, of a state having put into place some really effective reforms that were working. North Carolina used to be more of a red state. Then they passed elections reform, including same-day registration, early voting. That was increasing the number of people who were showing up to vote. That was also increasing the number of people of color who were showing up to vote, um, along with students um, and other groups that the GOP in this, you know, in this current climate, and we are a nonpartisan group, I have to say that, but that we, you got to call things out as they're happening too, the GOP. Um, both in North Carolina and in another a number of um, legislatures across the state, you know, um, felt uh, fearful once seeing, um, you know, an uh, increasing number of people showing up to vote, people who were not voting for them necessarily. So, um, you know, they put into place a, a, an omnibus package that eliminated same-day registration, that eliminated early voting, that eliminated um, pre-registration mm -hmm. um, for young um, voters. Um, and that um, also put into place a very onerous photo ID law. Um, they knew, and we know this now because of uh, the Fourth Circuit's um, holding um, in this case, they knew, the legislators knew that this photo ID actually um, was less accessible to voters of color than it was to white voters. Um, they asked county boards of elections for this kind of information and asked for a racial breakdown of who did or who didn't have, um, have the sorts of IDs that they potentially could be using, um, you know, uh, to screen people at the ballot box. Um, you know, that's where litigation comes in helpful, right? Because you can make these records requests, uh, you can file these lawsuits, you can get people on the record saying, you know, this is this is what happened. This is, um, you know, when when I got a request from legislators, this is the information that I provided for them. And then it's stark. It's clear as day. There are people out there who are intending to keep voters from the ballot box. That is the culture of our country today. Um, luckily, um, you know, uh, the Fourth Circuit um, uh, did away. Um, the, the holding in the Fourth Circuit um, required the legislature to undo, um, you know, the bad laws that they had put into effect. Um, but that doesn't stop right then and there because we continue to see these sorts of moves whenever an election is around the corner. And so, for example, I think probably a lot of you have heard about what's been going on in Georgia. Um, Secretary of State Kemp um, in Georgia um, has uh, been playing fast and hard with the registration rules for some time. So several years ago, uh, we noticed that um, you know, registration rates were dropping in the state of Georgia. And um, we, we filed a lawsuit uh, against Kemp because essentially what he was doing was um, targeting individuals who had missed elections during a three-year span and saying, well, because you're not voting from the address where I have you on file, I'm going to assume that you'll no longer live where you do. 
As such, I'm going to begin the purging process. And, you know, the National Voter Registration Act requires a two-step process before a state can remove a, a registrant from the rolls. But the problem here was not that he was going through that two-step process, sending out a mailer, then seeing whether or not they returned it before eliminating them from the rolls. It was what put them on that target list in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that was having missed a couple of elections. Now, there is nothing that says in the Constitution or anywhere else that you can't miss an election. In fact, because of your free speech rights, you may miss an election. There are lots of reasons, right, as we just talked about earlier today, why people do. They feel powerless. They feel as though their vote doesn't matter. So um, naturally, in some instances, people are just not going to show up for every election. Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, <clears throat> we lost that suit because the Supreme Court um, recently, um, over the summer, basically gave Georgia and Ohio, Ohio was the case that kicked up to the Supreme Court, carte blanche to engage in these kinds of practices. Never mind that it's poor practice. Um, never mind that I get it if a state wants to keep its, its rolls clean. You do it in an effective way. You do it in a fair way to the voter. There are ways to do that. For example, um, this is actually something that maybe you could um, uh, sort of like petition for um, in your in your respective states is um, joining ERIC, for example, um, the Electronic Registration Information Center. It's a way that uh, state roles can can sort of be updated as people move in and out of this in and out of the state without unfairly knocking people off the registration rolls. But, you know, all that's to say is that, you know, politicians in some instances, right, not all the time though, there there's a reason that they're engaging in these kinds of registration purges. Um, so in addition to that practice, Kemp, uh, I guess this was um, a little over a year ago and shortly after, um, or about half a year after he announced that he was running for governor, um, engaged in sort of like a, a second mass purging. On one day, his office purged about half a million registration records from the rolls. And some, um, some really great um, uh, reporting um, from APM discovered, some investigative reporting discovered that about 107,000 of those registrations um, were of individuals who actually still live um, where Kemp thinks they no longer live. So there's no justifiable reason for why these individuals should be cut from the registration list. They have not otherwise been disqualified. Um, <clears throat> but so there was that mass purging. Um, 107,000 of those um, should should not have been purged. Um, and then in addition to that too, as Jeanette was already mentioning, um, you know, what's another way to kind of like game the system and, and keep registrants off the rolls and thus, you know, away from the ballot box, um, especially when he's on on the ballot himself and that's um through holding up some of these other registrations because of you know a quote-unquote exact match law um again you know the office has put in pending status around 53,000 voter registrations and you know in a lot of these races it's sometimes 53,000 or 100,000 or some you know fraction thereof that can really kind of be the decider in an election um you know, 53,000 of these uh, registration records are um, are in pending status because Jeanette already mentioned, you know, the information that's in the registration record does not exactly match the information that, say, the DMV or another agency has on file. And there are a number of reasons why this isn't necessarily the case. Say you put a hyphen on your paper voter registration application, but the DMV, when you show up there to enter in your information, can't capture that hyphen. Or you put an accent um, you know, on your name on the paper registration record, but again, the DMV doesn't capture accents. So hmm. inevitably, there's not going to be an ex exact match there. Nevertheless, um, you know, these 53,000 voter registration records are being held up. Now, um, to be fair, Kemp has uh, sent along um, instructions to uh, poll workers saying, look, if the record that you have on file substantially matches up with what's on the photo ID, you have to give those individuals regular ballots. But why the holdup in the first place? Um, you know, this law um, is discriminatory, um, at least in its effect, because 80% um, of those whose registrations are being held up are people of color, 70% are black voters. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, Kemp, Secretary of, Ste Secretary of State Kemp, is um, running against Stacey Abrams, who, if she won, would be the first black governor in the state. 
So again, this is just one glimpse of like some of the country. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is one one state. Um, you know, um, one race. Um, you know, uh, again, in in sort of like a number of other poor and discriminatory practices across the country. And sometimes it requires uh, a piece by piece. Um, you know, approach, but at the same time, too, we are looking at the end of the day to have, have some kind of federal reform in these areas. It's just going to be kind of more of a marathon effort. Mm. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Picking up on something that Allegra mentioned, another, another way that the system fails to ensure um, that our electoral process is fair and that everyone has access to it is with the role of money in politics. Um, so under our current system, as I'm sure everyone here is aware, um, wealthy individuals and now corporations are able to exert a disproportionate uh, influence over the political dialogue and process. And this has a number of consequences. Sm uh, um, for one thing, a small and um, underrepresented underrepresentative group of uh, wealthy individuals and corporations overwhelm the voices of ordinary Americans um, in the campaigns that decide what the issues are going to be in a given election and who the people are that are elected to address those issues. Um, the exclusion of many citizens from campaign from these campaign conversations um, about what the issues are and who will be elected to address them undermines our, our fundamentally undermines our system of self-government. Um, this is actually what the entire First Amendment is supposed to be about is that we are electing people to represent our interests, um, but that doesn't happen when the people who influence those decisions are, are small and underrepresented group of people. Um, and it may have the further consequence, as um, my friends here have talked about, of diminishing turnout at the polls. If people feel like they don't have a voice in the process, why should they even bother to vote? Um, so Congress, particularly through laws enacted in the 1970s and then in 2002, sought to limit the effect of money in politics in a number of ways, but three of which I'll talk about today. Um, one, they passed laws restricting who can spend money to influence um, elections. So they prohibited corporations and foreign nationals from spending any money in connection with elections. Um, the, the laws also limited how much individuals can spend, uh, individuals and others can spend um, to give directly to candidates. And then um, they also passed other restrictions on spending, but the Supreme Court fairly quickly um, invalidated those. So I'm just going to talk about the contributions to candidates today. And then um, Congress, third, passed laws requiring disclosure, public disclosure, of the sources of money influencing uh, federal campaigns. Two recent Supreme Court decisions, one of which I'm sure everyone's, at least one of which I'm sure everyone's familiar with, significantly chipped away at two of those areas, and all, but all three continue to contribute to the problems that we see today. So I'll talk about those three areas in turn. Um, first, corporate spending on elections. So, Congress actually originally banned corporations from contributing to federal election campaigns back in 1907 in the Tillman Act. Um, but after Watergate, Congress passed a whole package of federal campaign finance laws in the Federal Election Campaign Act, including prohibiting corporations not only from contributing directly to candidates, but also from spending any money on um, communications to influence <coughs> elections. Now, in 2010, the Supreme Court in Citizens United, by a 5-4 to four vote, concluded that the part of the law banning corporations from participating um, directly in, <coughs> in campaigns, or excuse me, from spending money independently, um, quote unquote, to influence campaigns, um, such as by financing ads, advocating for or against candidates, violated the First Amendment rights of corporations. And as a result of that decision, corporation can now, corporations can now spend unlimited amounts of money from their general treasury funds to advocate for or against candidates that support, uh, that are consistent with their corporate interests. Um, notably, in reaching that decision, the Supreme Court didn't reject the notion that access to candidates could be bought. Justice Kennedy wrote, ingratiation and access are not corrupting. Um, that, and that preventing quid pro quo 
corruption, essentially direct trades of money for votes, was the only legitimate government interest um, that supports campaign finance restrictions. Sort of remarkably, um, the majority, I think it, Justice Kennedy suggested that the appearance and, of influence and access will not cause the electorate to lose faith in our democracy, but I think that that presumption has been uh, proven wrong since that time. Mm -hmm. um, but as a consequence, there are a number of consequences of Citizens United, um, but some important ones are that now corporations can spend unlimited resources to get their preferred candidates elected, um, and it's all legal as long as they don't formally coordinate with a candidate. Um, and we've kind of seen, particularly in the years since Citizens United, you know, how, how thin that coordination line is. I mean, you have um, groups that essentially take on the work that campaigns used to do themselves, but they don't officially talk to each other. Sometimes these groups are run by the same people that used to be um, part of the campaign itself, so they don't really need to talk because the people already know what, what would help the candidate. Um, but because they're not formally coordinating, um, they can spend as much money as they want to help the candidates. Um, in addition, a subsequent decision by the D.C. Circuit um, led to the advent of super PACs. So now, not only corporations can spend money from their general treasury funds themselves, but groups of cor corporations or groups of wealthy individuals can get together and pool their unlimited resources to advocate for or against candidates. Um, and then third, we have an, you've seen this increase of dark money electoral spending, which refers to um, in addition to these super PACs, which at least are political committees that have to disclose all of their donors, you have nonprofits that ostensibly are not political committees because they spend enough of their money on non-political activity to fall under the IRS rules for 501c3 or 527 um, or C4 groups. And so because those groups don't disclose their donors and they're not political committees, <coughs> They are able to um, spend spend unlimited f money on electoral advocacy, as long as it's not majority of their um, spending. And individuals and corporations can finance that spending without being disclosed as sources. So they can essentially, you know, you can have a nonprofit called Americans for a Better America, mm -hmm. funded completely by you know the Koch brother, brothers or Michael Bloomberg, and people won't, ha won't necessarily know that there is an individual underwriting all of that spending. Um, but this doesn't seem to be the disclosure regime that, um, that Justice Kennedy sort of envisioned in Citizens United, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so the second area that I wanted to talk about was contribution limits. So um, as I mentioned, in the Federal Election Campaign Act, Congress established a number of different types of contribution limits that are sort of the quote unquote base limits that apply to how much an individual can contribute to a candidate in a primary and a general election. Um, and then there were limits on how much could be contributed to political committees and parties. Um, and then in addition, there was something called an aggregate limit, which was essentially a ceiling um, on how much individuals could spend collectively on contributions to candidates, political committees, and parties. Um, and that ceiling was, was pretty high. In 2014, when the Supreme Court recently considered it, I think it was like $123,000, which is, at the time, was more than twice the median income um, in this country. And the Supreme Court in the Buckley v. Vallejo case back in 1976 actually considered the constitutionality of the aggregate contribution limit and upheld it as a... Um, as a law that prevented evasion of the base limits by um, preventing someone from essentially sort of circumventing the limits and funneling contributions ultimately to be directed to a particular candidate through a party or um, other candidates that in turn donate the money again to another, another candidate. Um, but in 2014, the Supreme Court reconsidered the aggregate limits in a case called McCutcheon versus FEC. Sean McCutcheon was an is still an individual who wanted to contribute as, as much as he wanted up to the base limits to as many candidates as he wanted and um, political parties as he wanted. And he wasn't able to do that because, as I said at the time, the, the 
ceiling was about $120,000, and that wasn't high enough for him. Um, and in another five to four decision, the Supreme Court struck down the aggregate limits, concluding as a matter of law that allowing an individual to make a large aggregate contribution to all of these different entities um, would not lead to quid pro quo corruption um, and kind of dismiss the notion that individuals might use parties to sort of um, circumvent the limits and and direct their money to a favored candidate. Um, although I know we know today that candidates establish leadership packs and and, um, and joint fundraising committees where they're ostensibly raising money for many different candidates, but in the end the money can all, even if it's initially sort of distributed among a number of candidates, it may well end up in the end in the pocket of the candidate that the individual was originally supporting. As a result of the McCutcheon and Citizens United decisions together, individuals can now max out on their base contribution limits for every single candidate, political party, and political committee, therefore um, spending millions of dollars to support their, favor their preferred parties and candidates. And as I mentioned, ultimately that money can be rerouted to a particular candidate. Um, in, in dissenting from the McCutcheon decision, the Justice Breyer described the majority opinion as creating a loophole that would allow a single individual to contribute millions of dollars to a political party or to a uh, candidate's campaign. Taken together with Citizens United, the decision eviscerates our nation's campaign finance laws, leaving a remnant incapable of dealing with the grave problems of democ dem democratic legitimacy that those laws were intended to resolve. I think just, you know, recently there's disclosure reports indicating that Sheldon Adelson, I think, and his wife contributed $25 million to support Republicans in the upcoming midterm elections, which was more on top of the $87 million they had already spent. Michael Bloomberg has pledged to spend $100 million um, in the upcoming weeks to support Democratic congressional candidates. So the notion that candidates don't feel some sort of indebtedness sense of indebtedness to individuals who are essentially bankrolling their campaigns, whether directly or indirectly, seems just really um, not credible. Another consequence of the McCutcheon decision has been intent attempts um, and continuing attempts by opponents of campaign finance laws to use any sort of tidbit they can from a decision as an opportunity to just further expand a loophole or to otherwise challenge the law. So um, I think last year, the year before, the um, DC Circuit and Bank rejected a case that I had actually um, litigated where um, a, group, a group found a couple of plaintiffs who said that they wanted to be able to um, donate higher contributions to candidates. Essentially, they wanted to be able to combine the amount you can give for a primary and a general, but just for the general. So, in other words, to make a double the limit contribution for the general election. And they attempted to use this language in McCutcheon where the court just referenced, as, used a shorthand reference to the amount you can give for primaries and generals together for purposes of analyzing a completely different law. But the party in that case tried to characterize that as some sort of constitutional holding about how much you can give. And that case was litigated through, you know, over a number of years. And I mean, it seemed like kind of a preposterous argument, but the courts took it seriously. And although we, you know, the FEC did ultimately prevail, it was, it required a fair amount of effort to get to that point. And these are the kinds of things we see frequently where parties will just take anything they can find in a decision and then use that as an opportunity to try to relitigate issues that we thought are you know, pretty well settled. Um, and the last area I wanted to talk about today was disclosure. So when the third, and I guess probably at this point, one of the most important tools um, that Congress established to make our, com our campaign finance system more democratic is to require public disclosure of political spending so voters know the sources of who's influencing our campaigns. And ironically, as bad as Citizens United was for unleashing corporate spending, unlimited corporate spending on um, our political system, eight justices, in that opinion, agreed that disclosure requirements help ensure that voters are fully informed about who is speaking during election, the election process. Um, and they upheld laws requiring disclosure for the sources of uh, the sources of advertising about candidates. 
um, Justice Kennedy went so far in that decision as to tout what the majority was establishing as a campaign finance system that pairs corporate independent expenditures with effective disclosure. But I think one of the lessons of that case has been that the disclosure prop, the disclosure system that exists today um, is not something we would really call effective. Um, even though Citizens United confirms that disclosure requirements are constitutional, current federal and state laws are not doing an effective job at actually providing, um, ensuring that spending is being disclosed. As I mentioned earlier, wealthy individuals and corporations are able to make, to spend money through nonprofits in order to hide who they are when they're paying for um, election-related advertising. Weak federal regulation and enforcement exacerbates that problem. And then further, a shift to online, the online forum for a lot of spending um, has sort of ref has um, revealed the lack of infrastructure in our in many in the federal and state regulatory systems to address that kind of advertising. A lot of the laws were were enacted before the internet existed, and so they just don't address this type. Um, of spending. And I think just last week there was another report of Russian operatives charged with participating in a scheme to spend over $10 million in, uh, to influence the upcoming midterm elections. Um, so obviously this is a serious problem. So now that it came to such a sunny picture of the state of our democracy, I thought I'd wrap up with a couple of positive developments and some things that we're doing at CLC to address these issues. Um, so when, and I think Allegra talked about this a little bit, are, is, um, you know, efforts, we're supporting efforts to enact better laws, particularly at the state and local level, um, including laws requiring greater transparency, addressing the gaps um, for regulating ads on, online, um, and working to create new public financing, financing systems. And on the public financing front, new programs have already been established in Seattle and D.C. Seattle. Um, in 2015 approved a one-of-its-kind democracy voucher program where they give citizens vouchers um, that they can use to support candidates that they prefer. We like public financing systems because they take money out of, private money out of the whole process, which prevents corruption. They, include, they increase the diversity of people who are participating, um, and they free up candidates to spend more time doing their jobs and less time dialing for dollars. Um, in addition, voters in Colorado, Michigan, Utah, and Missouri, I think, are con uh, considering anti-gerrymandering um, measures this, this coming November. Um, and voters in North Dakota are considering a ballot initiative that would require um, more disclosure about uh, transparency in um, campaign spending, including um, ads on the inter internet. We also um, are, participate in litigation, both defensive litigation and sometimes uh, challenges to FEC decisions, um, seeking to defend laws that are on the books, some of the cases that I mentioned earlier, um, but also seeking judicial review when the FEC isn't doing its job um, of, of investigating clear violations of the act. Um, and, oh, and lastly, speaking of the FEC, we, um, we work on tr trying to make sure the FEC does its job, not only through litigation, but also um, through commenting on advisory opinions, commenting on rulemaking, seeking rulemakings on, um, on issues that we think the FEC needs to address. So. Oh, thank you. Sure. Thank all of you. <laughs> Scary. Thank, thank you. All of the Although we highlighted some of the challenges and obstacles, thank you all for the information and your vote counts, and we can combat, you know, the big money bags if more people go vote. So thank you very much. That is right.